Okay. Well, we got a couple of questions uh, in the the chat. I don't know if you want to roll back through that. Um, you should still be able to see it. Sure. Let me see. Thanks, Kurt. Um, let's see. Uh, well, there was some questions about, or some comments about loyalty programs, um, which I think we did talk about. Um, so I don't know if there's if there's much more to say on that. Um, I, uh, actually, I I was yeah. thinking as Meredith was talking. Now that you you go back and watch it, and it's horrible to watch yourself talk, but at the same time, you do hear things that you didn't hear the first time. And when Meredith was talking about the Starbucks reward program, I remember thinking um, just now, there's a lot of information in what I'm ordering from my coffee company at a given time. Like there's the idea of when I am more tired. So what my actually daily habits are, what when I might be more stressed or having more anxiety, um, depending on if I'm ordering, you know, more sweet drinks or just going and getting something really fast. And I think there's a habit of deducing things that we don't think are personal to like that's not a big deal it's I, I can give that information away without thinking all of the secondary or tertiary information that can be derived from it and so just just a encouragement as you're in loyalty programs not to see it as just like your receipt from the grocery store or the drugstore etc but th that that can um reveal a lot of sensitive information that you're not seeing on the receipt. But I think Eric Meredith's point was still valid is that it still pales in comparison to Google search history. So it's not on the same level, but there is more to it than I think um, meets the eye. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think there is sort of this like, um, th there's that big example, right, about, about Target and uh, you know how Target kind of looking at, I can't exactly remember what information they looked at, right, but uh, kind of by looking at uh, the way that this girl was shopping, um, you know, kind of deduced that she was pregnant, sent a mailer to her house, her father saw it, was outraged that they sent her this mailer, and then came back later and was like, actually, turns out you knew more about what was going on in my house than I did, um, which is disturbing in, in all kinds, on all kinds of levels. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we got this question here. Um, how is data protection being collaborated internationally, and what are we doing right or bad versus that of other countries? I just see Amy's like head in her hand. <laughs> so the U.S. little known international fact, um, even among people who work among pri on privacy and data protection, the U.S. used to be the leader. Like the fair information practices. Um, the core document came from the United States. And so we used to be way out in front. Now that was 40 plus years ago. And now we are so far behind. Um, it does, it's, it's really sad. And so Europe is really the country leading um, on data protection. And a lot of different countries are starting to adopt the model that they used in the general data protection regulation, which is great, although I think um, we've even just in the, the very short time that law has been enacted have seen ways that it can be improved upon. Um, companies are maybe interpreting its provisions um, to let them continue doing what they did before. Um, and advocates in Europe are very angry about that and they say this is not what this means. But now that we know that's how it's being interpreted, we can improve upon it. And so the Conversations in the US, I think we'll eventually get a privacy law um, and we have a chance, we have a real chance to have it be better than Europe and have it set a new standard internationally um, and have people try to improve their own laws to meet that. But it's going to take a lot of work and I don't think we're near as far along as we would like to be. The only other thing worth mentioning with, and Haley can talk about this so much better than I can, um, but with the CCPA and with different countries, first of all, with different countries having their own privacy law, and then with California's privacy law and the threat, even like the vague threat of states passing different privacy laws, you'll hear a lot about the patchwork. And just to note, like, there have been a patchwork of privacy laws, of data breach laws, of 
employment laws. Um, companies have always had to comply with a lot of different things. What we want is laws that are not inconsistent with one another, but that build upon each other. So I think it's okay to have a patchwork where some are stronger and some are weaker, as long as like you're not creating a system where like you cannot possibly comply with this law and this law at the same time. Like this law says you cannot um, give information away for anybody over 15. And this law says this, you have to give information away for anybody between 13 and 18. And like, there's a, a internal inconsist inconsistency there we should watch out. Um, yeah, I agree with everything Amy said. I think, um, you know, if you, <laughs> always, just generally, um, <laughs> if you look at, um, just in a couple ways that they're different, I think if you look at Europe, they tend to be a lot more, we, I talked in the panel uh, a bit about being opt-in versus opt-out. I think in Europe, they, they do look at that opt-in model a little bit more. They're also a little bit clearer about saying, you know, you, uh, you use data for certain purposes and, and those, are, those are the purposes that you can use it for. Um, but yeah, as Amy said, you know, G, I mean, this stuff is hard. Uh, legislating it is hard. It's hard to wrap your head around. It's, you know, we had this whole panel about one idea, right? So um, I think uh, as we see how Europe is proceeding, and maybe uh, hopefully we can learn lessons from that and and build that into our own um, our own laws. Um, and yeah, I think uh, also as Amy alluded to, um, so we in California we have the California Consumer Privacy Act. That's the CCPA that we refer to. Um, you know, that is a it is a good starting point for where I think we would, EFF would like to see privacy law move forward. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, there are a lot of things that I would change about it and have tried to change about it and uh, maybe would have been more successful in changing about it if the legislature did not have to deal with COVID-19 this year, um, which is a priority I understand, I should be clear. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, and I think uh, other states are also looking at California and coming up with their own ideas. And we've had so many conversations with legislators just about, okay, how do we make these laws work together? What could we do better? Um, and the federal government is paying attention to that conversation. And so um, I think we are on a path. I don't know how long we will be on this path, but I do think we are on a, on a, we're on good footing um, to, to get something. Well, it's a good point about state legislation. If we come up with some scheme for getting paid for your data, it seems like it would knock out a lot of this privacy protection across the board or, or modify it in some, some way, shape, or form. So I think that's another strike against it. Um, so I you know, wonder what you think about that. It's, it seems like it would be hard. They're, they're, they're kind of uh, different. They're different goals heading in different directions. And I don't, and I don't see how they could possibly be compatible. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to tease that out of my head a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think you're right, and I think you know, Amy brings up the good point about you want, just want to make sure that there isn't like destructive interference, right? That that laws in different states aren't conflicting with each other. And yeah, I think adopting this sort of model um, of monetizing data is very destructive to a lot of other things that we want to do. That's a good point. There's, um, we, ha we are at a weird time in the US because like, I, I don't want to call them lazy, but, but members of Congress who want to do something on this issue, I think sometimes they're like, why don't we just copy the GDPR? And some of them have been like, why don't we just copy the CCPA? Each of those have significant problems for totally unique reasons. But if we get a really, really weak state law, um, and it will have the same consequence. We're going to have members of Congress saying, why don't we just copy, I'm not gonna name a state, I have a couple in mind, but like, why don't we just copy this like super weak law? And all of a sudden you have members of Congress from that state that have bought into that and that think it's a great idea and it'll have champions. And so there is a risk um, greater than any single state in passing a weak law, that it then gets um, into the federal conversation and colors it in some dangerous ways. And we should be watching for that, especially with pay for privacy. Um, and the, the chances that people could become used to a system that doesn't reward them in the ways they think it might. Um, 
on the other side, it could get past and people could see like, this is not what we thought it was going to be. So maybe that could be a good thing as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I think um, that it's a very good point about state laws. I think, you know, again, what we at EFF are, what, one of the things that keeps me up at night is the idea that, you know, some state will pass a law that sounds good, but does not actually do that much. And then the federal government will take it and say, and this overrides all the other laws in all the other states. So, um, you know, if, uh, you know, we would just want to see a federal law that doesn't take away any of the rights that, that, that states have given their, um, their citizens. And uh, yeah, so that's another concern. Well, I wonder if the industry would, um, you know, if they would come up with some scheme for just paying you a, a pittance, a real small amount, to, to basically knock out all this, this privacy legislation and kind of take us back to the days of the Wild West, which we haven't really gone that far from it. We're still pretty much in those days. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely true. I mean, certainly we have seen... Um, not naming names or states. We've seen companies get involved in proposals in various states um, that, you know, I think we we do think, um, you know, just kind of want to throw you a bone, um, which is essentially what uh, pay for privacy or data dividend, both those models um, feel like. Um, so uh, I do think that's a strategy. I think uh, often those solutions are tried are sold as like a compromise solution, right? Nobody's happy, so it must be the right um, solution. And uh, again, I just I find that approach very um, troubling. So we got Scott, a question if we could about take this question down here. Yeah, the DNA yeah, question. Gonna, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was going to jump on the DNA test question. This I have gotten this question like eight times over the last two weeks. I don't know what has happened in the world. Like, I feel like there's a new story I missed that everybody is now talking about DNA tests again. They get real like there are periods when they're really hot and then you don't hear about them for a while. But I've gotten a lot on this in the last two weeks. Um, I my family is it, we're members of my family are really into ancestry and like figuring out where they've come from and where my different family members are. So a lot of them have taken these DNA tests. I will say I have not, I don't ever plan on it, um, at least not under the current laws. And I tend to advise against them, but they have really great benefit, especially for people who have institutional reasons for not knowing their ancestry. Um, think about back in the United States under the slave days, you have a lot of people who came from those communities who were slaves who don't know where they came from because none of those records were kept. And there are benefits in being able to figure out where your family is from. There's like a, a sense of self that you can derive from that. So there are huge benefits. And so I hate telling people don't do this because I know there are internal benefits, but we need so many stronger laws to block out what companies can do with that information. We've yet to scratch the surface on how it can be manipulated um, and used against you potentially. And now that people are taking this information, are taking these tests, it's like the, the cat is out of the box. Um, Pandora's box has been open. And so trying to get some laws about protecting that information from being manipulated or misused when law enforcement can get access to that information. Um, some of these companies just like are willing to give access to their databases or turn it over full stop. Um, and it's not only you that are that's implicated, but it's everybody in your family. So DNA isn't personal. This is another problem with pay for privacy. It's not just your data. It's your whole family's data. So are you going to pay everybody in that person's genealogical tree if they do a DNA test? Um, so I, I just think that the, this is an area where the law hasn't kept up and to people's detriment because there's a lot of benefits to be derived from this information. Um, Florida has passed what I think is the first very specific genetic privacy law in the country, specifically on this topic, and it's about police access. And I think it's probably because Florida is the home of where a lot of these um, law enforcement cases were happening, where companies were turning information over to the police. And Florida also has a, a heavy libertarian bent in some circles. So those two things come together. And I think you got this genetic privacy law, but it's even it's not enough because it doesn't hit the company side.
Okay, well, I will say uh, something more about the, the DNA tests that they're uh, looking at different parts of the genome, and I'll talk a little bit about my situation. I actually um, took uh, two different tests from two different companies because I have a chronic condition, and I was participating in a research project where they were actually using the data. So the good thing about it is that you can get massive, you know, massive sequencing done for much less money than you used to be able to do, and you can enter research. Uh, you know, you actually actually turn it over to a university and enter. Um, turn the data over and enter, you know, a research project, uh, you know, and I made sure that it was uploaded in a secure way. But uh, you, you, one of the things you notice is that they're looking at different parts of the genome, which is going to give them different information. And I had one of the services telling me that I was 100% European and another service tell me that I was a third Native American Indian. And I know because I have, we have a, a family tree that goes back eight generations because we had somebody who used to track that and I'm actually one eighth Cherokee so um, so it, it, you know neither service got it quite right but they're looking at different parts of the genome so they're going to see you differently nobody I don't know of anybody that's sequencing the entire genome at this point so you're going to get to situations where it's the same person and they look at you very differently and they might interpret it very differently so that's another thing to think about There's that uh, information about the uh, the Golden State Killer and his family members taking the test, and you know how that's how that's been used by law enforcement. If you want to talk about that briefly, the, you know, there's uh, always there's always good stuff that comes from invasions of private, or can be good stuff. Um, there's also tremendous abuse, and we we hear about benefits to society, and we don't hear about the abuse until it's too late. And so, yes, this is absolutely true, but what are the costs for turning this information over to law enforcement? And it's going to live in their databases because law enforcement doesn't like to get rid of information. Um, and how can it be used? So I, I yes. <laughs> yes, and probably for, for a long time to come. Um, so I, are, if there are, are there any more questions, this is a great time to ask, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, otherwise we may need to wrap up and get to some final comments. We've got one more typing. And Come on, and Tom. You, go, Tom. <laughs> go, Tom. Thank you very much for, uh, thank you very much for, for coming back out for, for round two on this. Oh yeah, my pleasure. I mean, I I so wish we were in Atlanta uh, right now, but in some alternate universe. But this is this is very nice, and we appreciate so much the work that that DragonCon and EF Georgia have done um, to get all this together. <laughs> the biggest of plus ones to that. There's so much good media. I feel like this past year there would have been so many amazing costumes. Oh, Just from how many great TV shows and movies and things people could have. I want to see that that eleven outfit from Stranger Things. I know people made that. Well, we did our parade by shooting one person at a time, and then stringing them all together. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that's a very interesting question, Tom. I don't know that I know enough about medical privacy to answer that or property law <laughs> so we like to think hipaa is a medical privacy law um it has some privacy components to it but it's really not um i was like the i'm going to take it out of the medical context for a for a minute though because i think that medical privacy is its own space um and that complicates things but we are seeing and have for like 10 years seeing companies data like personal data that they've collected be seen as a commodity when they go bankrupt and then be sold as a commodity to people who they would have never anticipated and that is another potentially harmful practice because it really goes against anything in their privacy policy um, that this is allowed to happen and people have no control over it at that point because the entity sometimes has ceased to exist as an entity um, 
so that's it. There's a lot of threats with where these records go, and people are, are even less in control when it happens that um, companies go bankrupt or go out of business. We've got a few more typing. Um, well, I, I don't know how to answer the, the insurance company question without a little well, more context. State the question first, maybe state the question first. Yeah, um, but while we're doing that, I, I can speak to the, to the second one about uh, newer technology, deep learning, um, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not maybe a very satisfactory answer, but um, I think people are starting to look at this particularly, um, you know, uh, sort of in the in the realm of kind of algorithmic transparency and you know sort of in that vein um, it is you know legislation moves much slower than technology um, I, I think you know a lot of what we're trying to do in privacy space right now is set down principles that are technology agnostic so um, a lot of what we talked about right don't collect more data than you need don't use it for purposes other than you collect it don't um, share it or sell it with people um, or with other entities without asking people um, uh, if they if you have their permission to do so. Um, deep learning is tricky, right? I mean, I think um, we don't know really enough about what it does and how it will be applied to know how to legislate, to even to evaluate all the harms and then to legislate to protect them. Um, so I think there's a lot of thinking. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, thought from academics and politicians and you know all sorts of, of people trying to start those conversations now so that we can uh, arrive at a at a satisfactory solution more quickly. But yeah, it takes a lot of data to be useful. You don't want to undermine sort of the you know the progress on, on the research, but you also want to be sure that you're protecting people, um, and that's gonna that's gonna take a lot of time. Um, de deep learning is also is a further complication to pay for privacy because if a company pays me five dollars or whatever arbitrary amount of money for like five pieces of information about me and then they put that into a deep learning system and are able to determine 50 other pieces of information about me do they pay me for that information um, or for only the the facial information that I turn over so I think there are going to be that is going to complicate this this area even more and it's going to implicate um, big companies big companies are going to have the authority and the power and the ability to do that more than small companies which means they will have to pay less potentially in a system like this and there's a, there was another question um why did my insurance company want to pay me a hundred dollars for a nurse to come and ask me questions I don't know the answer to that other than, um, I mean, it, it, these are very specific individual circumstances, but um, I, companies want information about you. So I, it actually, this is a, a question very specific to me. I de identify as a woman. I was born identifying as a woman. And when I go to the doctor every single time, they ask me, um, when was the first day of my last period? Um, I apologize if that grosses anybody out. I know there's stigma, whatever. I'm getting over the stigma. Um, I didn't, it wasn't until I was in my late 20s that I found out that is not a question that is necessary for a medical reason. That is a question that the insurance company wants the doctors to ask so they have that information, um, which is what I was told by somebody. Like they have no use for that at the doctor's office. And I'd been answering that question my you know entire adolescent and adult life. and did not know that it wasn't medically relevant. And so I think there's a lot of information insurance companies want to have. I don't know enough about the insurance companies to know why, but data is useful and data is valuable. And especially in their current data economy, um, it behooves them to know more than to know less. 
I was today years old when I learned that, Amy. So. <laughs> Cool. Okay, we got another message coming. Okay. By the way, this um, this part of the talk is also being separately recorded, and uh, it will record the chat. So. Mm. I love this like new paradigm of meetings we're all in, where it's like if someone is typing, everyone's just like mm -hmm. sitting there with popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this really weird thing where now people can write a Google document together and you can watch somebody edit your work. Have you, if anybody has ever watched somebody edit their work, there's just so much anxiety that goes into that of like, are they about to delete something I wrote? And what, do, what is wrong with that sentence? And that's like watching the chat, I feel kind of some of that same anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, Amy knows, uh, Scott knows too, I think. In my past life, I was a reporter, and I like, you, you know, so newsrooms have that capacity, you know, that uh, capacity all the time, and it, I never watched anybody edit. I was like, just, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee uh, and not have it tracked by a loyalty program. And At Starbucks. <laughs> This does not surprise me that this particular person in the chat just said that they mess with people by copying and pasting when it look, to make it look like they're typing. Um, I see. OK, so value in, in that data in terms of uh, determining pregnancy. But um, I think if you're, if you're not, maybe if you're not, uh, if you're pretty sure you're not pregnant, <laughs> less value. Yeah. Or there can always just be the is there any reason to think that you're pregnant question? Like right. that, that this level of abstraction, like let me get more information to determine information that I need, but I get more along with that. It's like people who ask for your birthday to determine if you're 21, really all they need to know, are you 21 or are you 18? But then they get your birthday along with that and that's providing more information for mm -hmm. a smaller purpose. Right. It's very identifying information. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, credit cards versus cash. Um, I mean, so uh, let's see. I, I will say EFF just signed on to a letter asking uh, to pass the Payment Choice Act, um, which is a, a federal law uh, or bill um, asking that we preserve the ability to pay with cash. Um, I think, you know, as with so many privacy things, um, there is a lot of... Um, there are a lot of trade-offs and a lot of things that people have to kind of weigh uh, for themselves when it comes to, uh, you know, how they want to use different products, how they want to pay. Um, but uh, we always want to have the option, right? So I think cash is privacy pre preserving in a lot of ways. Um, I think it also uh, is important to keep accepting cash in terms of, uh, you know, people who are unbanked or underbanked. And so um, certainly in the context of the pandemic, we have seen a greater push to um, have uh, businesses move to not accepting cash. And um, we're pretty troubled by that. I think cash serves an important um, function in society. And so, uh, you know, uh, data collection is part of it, um, and access is another part of it. So I'm pro cash. <laughs> And just to bring this back around to the topic at hand, if you're trying to use cash to be privacy protective and you scan your loyalty card because what you're buying is on sale, you have defeated the purpose. So just be aware of the fact that um, you might not be able to get sale prices if, you just not, if you're trying to protect your privacy. Yeah, and a private privacy, privacy tax. tax. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, I, I, think, I think probably about to wrap it up, point, but, but uh, uh, I've got some, got final, some final thoughts, thoughts maybe, 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 uh, you're about um, to your data. Yeah, I mean, I think, oh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of garble. Um, okay, <laughs> using someone else's loyalty card. Yeah, there you go, just throw someone else's card on the bus. Uh, <laughs> No, don't do that. Um, I think uh, we made pretty clear in the panel, um, you know, when it comes to getting paid f paid for your data or um, the similar but not identical system of um, getting a discount for your data, uh, being charged less for, for sharing your data. Um, you know, I, I understand why it is appealing, but uh, it's really something that we um, want to fight. Um, I think it sets the wrong idea, the wrong, um, kind of frame for the way that we should be thinking about privacy and the way that we can think about um, changing the system that we're in right now. Um, and so I just really encourage people, um, you know, as this comes up, um, you know, think about it for yourselves. Um, and uh, again, think about how it affects people who are not like you. Yeah, I would just... Plus. Scott, can't you go on mute? I can hear myself back at me. Okay, hang on. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just want to plus one what Haley said. And at like I if you work in privacy, you hear all the time, I have nothing to hide. Or um, you know, I'm not scared of this, or I I don't mind this information. And so to to kind of tack on to Haley's point, to just never privacy is not something you can think of as an I. It, it has to be a we or a everybody um, when you're talking about protecting it. And some of the laws right now are increasingly leaning toward rep or recognizing household or community privacy. And I think that that is the only way um, we're going to be able to preserve the ideals that privacy is built around preserving. And when you hear about a specific proposal and your first instinct is, I'm OK with this, um, to do what Haley recommends and to, to look at how it might impact other people um because i think she's totally 100 percent unquestionably right okay uh i just want to say uh thanks thanks to you too thanks for everybody in the audience for um participating and i think we'll go ahead and wrap it up here um and uh you enjoy the rest of dragon con goes virtual we'll be back with the Next talk at five o'clock. I'll go ahead and put the uh, schedule in the chat so you can get the rest of the day and the rest of the weekend. And thanks to everyone. And uh, be saying goodbye. <laughs> thanks, Scott. Good to yeah. see you, Haley. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks again.